maybe, uh, I don't know, is this too low? No, it's good. Yeah, let's go. Okay. Eli? Uh, you hear me? Yeah? Okay, there we go. Okay, seven line prayer. Praise the Shakyamuni Buddha. Teacher, Bodhisattva, destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, houndsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, bow destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings and go for refuge. Teacher, Bo Destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, houndsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, Supreme One, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, Bo Destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings and go for refuge. Teacher, Bo Destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, Bodhisattva, destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings and go for refuge. When you, chief of humans were born, you took seven steps on this great earth and said, I am, I am supreme, supreme in this world. To you who were wise at that time, I prostrate. Completely pure body, supremely fine form, ocean of wisdom like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, supreme protector, to you I prostrate. Endowed with the supreme marks, a face like a stainless moon, color like gold, to you I pay homage. The three worlds are not like you who is free from dust. Mattress one, endowed with knowledge, to you I prostrate. Protector endowed with great compassion, omniscient teacher, feel devotion like merits and good qualities, to the thus gone I prostrate. Through purity, free from attachment, through virtue, releases from the evil gone realms, unique, supreme, ultimate meaning, to the Dharma that brings peace I prostrate. From freedom, teaching the path, well abiding in the pure trainings, holy field endowed with good qualities, to the Sangha also I prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma refuge, homage to the great Sangha, to all three ever devout homage, to all worthy with respect, filing with bodies as many as all realms, atoms, and all aspects with supreme faith, I pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous actions, Accumulate virtue and goodness. Subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Like a star, a mirage, a lamp, illusions, drops of dew, bubbles, dreams, lightning, and clouds. Look at all conditioned phenomena as such. Due to this merit, having attained the state of the all-seeing, and thereby subduing the enemy of faults, may I liberate migrators from the ocean of existence stirred by waves of aging, sickness, and death.
I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the positive potential I create by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the joyful happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from holding some close and others distant. <clears throat> Respectfully, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actualized and imagined. I confess all my negative actions accumulated since beginning this time, and rejoice in the virtuous actions of all ordinary and noble beings. Please, Buddha, remain as our guide, and turn the wheel of dharma until samsara ends. Through the merit created by myself and others, may the two bodhicittas ripen, and may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. This offering I make of a precious jeweled mandala, together with other pure offerings and wealth, the virtues we have attained throughout the three times with our body, speech, and mind. O oh, my masters, my yidams, and the three precious jewels, I offer all to you with unwavering faith. Accepting these out of your boundless compassion, please send forth waves of your blessings. Yidam guru ratna mandalakam yinatayami. Out of the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra. I'll give the kids a moment to go off to little Buddhas. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time the Bhagavan was dwelling on mass of Altruist Mountain in Rajagriha, together with a great community of monks and a great community of Bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avarokiteshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then, through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avarokiteshvara, How should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avarokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Shariputra. Putra. Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly, beholding those five aggregates also empty of inherent nature. Form is empty, emptiness is form, emptiness is not other than form, form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristics, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomena. There is no eye element, and so on, and up to and including no mind element, and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, and up to and including no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Jayaputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom. 
the mind without obscuration and without fear, having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequal, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth, since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared, Tayata, gate, gate, paragate, parasangate, bodhi, soha. Payata, gate, gate, paragate, parasangate, bodhisoha. Shariputra, the bodhisattva, mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commended the bodhisattva, mahasattva, Arya Avarukaneshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of lineage, it is like that, it is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom, just as you have indicated, even the Tadakata's rejoice. The Bhagavan, having thus spoken, the Venerable Shaivadi Putra, the Vasapha, Arya Avrakiteshvara, those surrounding their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, Ashuras, and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagavan. To fulfill the needs of all beings at their various levels of understanding, we request that you turn the wheel of Dharma, including the lesser and greater common and extraordinary approaches. Thank you, Lama. Okay. Let's, uh, let's take 12 minutes to dwell in the perfection of wisdom, shall we? The silent sitting.
How are we doing? <laughs> okay. okay. I'm totally open to technological glitches and technological advice. So if, if people, in a kind way, so if, if people can't hear or uh, those in the remotely can't hear, then there's a way for us to find out, right? Because I won't always see it, you know, you don't have to be waving or something like that. Or I'll look over here. Um, I can't see that, but you can, somebody can uh, let me know. Jules or Matthew. Okay. <clears throat> uh, today I, I'm going, you're not just going to hear from me, but also from uh, Elizabeth Zima, uh, who uh, is joining us remotely, um, will help me present a, uh, a PowerPoint presentation about uh, Abhidharma. I'm really old, so I said, do we have a slideshow? <laughs> no, apparently. Um, <clears throat> so uh, Elizabeth and I have been talking about um, Abhidharma for a number of months, and um, she's been reviewing the Abhidharma texts which are um, quite um, detailed, um, a lot of respect for that. Um, even uh, traditional style is we just read through it without trying to understand it. So um, maybe she's at the point of having read through it and not understanding it. So then, then we have to have a second read. <clears throat> and then uh, so I have my friend and colleague Colleen Wong to be here today, and she's here. Hey, and, um, I'll ask Colleen to we're um, in formation to put some kind of program together for uh, pathers with folks that are doing secular dharma, and to help me um, do a secular dharma program here at the temple. We haven't set a date yet, but Colleen and I are going to do a everyday mindfulness workshop this year, right? <laughs> We've been waiting two years for COVID, <laughs> for everything, yeah. So um, uh, at the Lions Roar on the website, I say uh, that we're doing um, a new form of humanism. Uh, or humanistic Buddhism that embraces both the secular and sacred as a path of transformation. What exactly is secular or sacred is open for debate, right? You know, or prayers sacred and meditation secular. Uh, this ongoing thing uh, on the Buddhists around. <laughs> um, I looked up secular and it's somewhat related to the Latin having to do with the times, uh, of the times, so um, we need to be of the time, and the times here, uh, I don't believe that uh, in Sacramento means that I want to, how I see the times, I guess, is to address justice issues. It's absolutely necessary to have gender uh, openness, gender equality, and A couple of years ago, I said, well, to be a male, we have to say, do we have to say that I'm here? You need to like, say, okay, so we're in our structure. Teachings are generally uh, have to be presented in the West, and that way is recognizing generally you have to talk uh, 
using psychological language. Generally using technical Buddhist language, for example, or using psychological language. And we have to use, has to use scientific language too. Somewhat in the, pretty much in the scientific world, particularly as far as metaphysics um, goes, and ask people here to be at least vaccinated, right? That's just like I'm old, so I've caught COVID, luckily. Married to a nurse, and that's a pre existing condition, so there's no way. I'd ever compromise on that, right? Whatever your frickin' belief is. <laughs> you know, you feel the energy there. No, we're doing we're doing science-based stuff, guys. Yeah. But uh, we can also do um, rituals and meditations in different Buddha forms and talk about the path to the turn of truth. Which um, might be kind of my working definition of sacred that um, seem to be true uh, no matter what the circumstance. <clears throat> seem to be true no matter what the circumstance. That doesn't mean it's in another realm. When I talk to people about um, get very relative or situational ethics, I bring up the awful example that can it ever, ever be right to engage in child abuse? Can it? Could there ever be a reason? Could it ever be of any benefit? No, because it can't be of benefit, right? It could never be of benefit. Really. So that, that is our idea of uh, that it's absolute truth. It's not that it's in another realm. We just know like, it can never be of any benefit. There can be no good karmic outcome. So therefore, it can't have any uh, delusion. It can't, it can't uh, even though it's a fact uh, that it happens, it can't uh, be beneficial. So we know that would be like almost a sacred truth and secular truth at the same time, right? Only because there's a context, and two, because you can't imagine a circumstance where it would be useful. Sorry, this is the way therapists think. So we talked like this so, about you know, we're going to use hot, heavy duty issues, but that's how Buddhism started. As the Buddha said, I'm willing to talk about suffering. And we talk about the difficult issues that don't seem to be solved by our usual rituals, or our usual power structure, or even our usual yogas. We're just going to talk to, about some nitty gritty stuff. So, the first teaching at Sarnath. Well, summarizes the Four Noble Truths, the truth of suffering, but um, Buddha just didn't say there's suffering, probably just started talking about all the stuff that we have to go through. And uh, um, there's some truths that we know that are going to be irrespective about suffering that seem to be consistent or have continuity through different circumstances. So my working uh, definition of sacred is things that uh, seem to be ongoing or continuous, which is the meaning of Tantra, and at the same time express themselves um, in the context, the real lived context, the real embodied time and place, which is also Tantra. So. <clears throat> we have till 12.30, can we go that far? How, how, long, how long will the kids last, do you think? <laughs> That's context. How long, how long will they? Like, we have this uh, kind of wonderful story, little Buddhas, but you know, that sometimes we should call them like little Buddhas to be, right? <laughs> they do. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, temple practice isn't. Um, it's not monastic practice, although we have monastics here, obviously. It's 
not a retreat center, even though we've done the retreat yesterday. That's not just a study center, um, like a school or university. It's not just a Buddhist studies program. Um, it's uh, all of that and community and Sangha. So, <clears throat> and in the community. So one of these days I'm hoping, you know, some, some neighbors, neighbors have dropped by occasionally. More than here. Yeah, Ruben, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the style here is not uh, just a service. Yeah, so services we're doing the prayers, but also meditation and then kind of class and discussion, right? That's very American. <laughs> In the monastery, you don't. The teacher just lectures and then calls on you. I don't know if that's kind of like law school. Is it? You know, like that. Yeah, and they're just on the spot, you know, like that. It's, you know, it's, I just, usually I have a trauma response. I just blank out. You could ask me what my name was. I would just blank out on the spot. You know, like, Who knew I do not? I don't know. It's so good. <laughs> just kidding. You know. She's not listening. She's working. So, yeah. Yes, I know. <laughs> so, yeah, so I have to mention Sabrina. She's like not my student. That's important. And I'm not her teacher, and I'm also not her therapist. Doesn't work. These are boundaries, right? They're important, right? You know, so she has her own. She has her own um, practice, uh, and uh, Mahamudra practice. But, um, she got her own. She's kind of a um, uh, you know, has been a personal attendant to her children, and, uh, so Alan Wallace and many people. Uh, I think there was some recent thing with Emma online. Uh, she's too old and paid three hundred dollars and you couldn't get online. That's infuriating if you're honest with that. But it's a donation. So uh, we want to bring up um, new female teachers in Emma. Um, He's 15, 10, 15 years older than him, right? So that's going to happen. It's happening just from here. So. Uh, the traditional thing is for um, you, you watch how your students teach, and then uh, in, in, the, in the middle, you also correct them. So that, that's really difficult practice, right? Um, you know, so Sima is going to say a few things. And <laughs> she's smiling. And then, you know, she say a few things, and then I'll go, well, then not really. That it's more like this. But that's, that's the way it goes. Um, uh, yeah, so this is a setup? I didn't go through this, but um, <laughs> yes, yeah. No, she knows this already. No, she knows this already. But uh, in kind of the old days in therapy, you know, training as an intern, um, they they used to put you in a room with a two-way mirror, uh, and actually what the there's a room that's not used like that anymore in my way up or to a mirror and the supervisor would sit behind the mirror and watch you do therapy and then be a little mic or something like that. And that always felt like can you relax? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Or then you'd have to tape, you know, say, okay, we're taping this um, and then I have to review the session with my supervisor afterwards. And, can you sign that? That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's <was> awful. <laughs> but here it's even worse because it'll be just real time. 
Do we, do we, uh, I'd just like to introduce uh, her now, and I don't know how we put up the um, the slideshow. Oh, I know it's PDA. Can we put it up, and then uh, can you say, uh, can you do a little introduction? Yeah, okay. Let's see, let's see if her voice comes through. Oh, can you hear me, Lama? Yeah, they can hear you too. Huh. Okay. So this is uh, this is Lama's presentation, which I'll present, evidently. <laughs> um, and we've been working on this for more than a few months. So I think we started this in 2020. So it's been around for a long time. Um, and it took a long time to think about. So well, the biggest message we'd like to give you is the Abhidharma is worth cultivating and it takes time. And what we're trying to do is to give you the beginner's guide. And we're going to do it through the eyes of Stephen Goodman who wrote the book, The Buddhist Psychology of Awakening. It's a great introduction. It's an excellent book. It really uh, allowed me to begin to understand consciousness and what's happening and with consciousness and how key it is to um, Buddhism. And this, his book is based on the Abhidharma Kosha, which was by Vasubandhu, one of the Nalanda monks, um, uh, whose brother, Asanga, also wrote, wrote or interpreted the Abhidharma Samachaya. That one I've read, and the Ornament of Abhidharma <clears throat> I've read parts of, but not the whole thing. It's a little bit difficult. You should explain what that is. Should explain what the Abhidharma Kosha the and Abhidharma Samachaya is. No, ornament, because you put it next to Abhidharma Kosha, and then you have ornament. What is in the Kosha, it's a commentary. Right, it's a commentary. It's a commentary that he did of a series of public speaking that he did in Nalanda. And he boiled down parts of the Abhidharma into um, almost like poetry, very short, precise uh, pith instructions for small snapshots of the Abhidharma. The Abhidharma actually is a part of the three Pitakas which were the three uh, parts that the uh, Buddhist community identified that the Buddha talked about. The first one was the sutras. The second is the Vinaya, which is the laws of the, of the monastics. And the third is the Abhidharma. And the Abhidharma is like, uh, the uh, algorithm of Buddhism, the algorithm of consciousness. It is like the pit, pith instruction of consciousness. Let me jump in here for a second to explain process. So um, there was a monk in the fifth century at uh, this huge university. When I say monastery, it's like True monastery, but more like university. And uh, he would be giving lectures um, during the day uh, on Abhidharma or higher Dharma, drawing from all the available knowledge at the time. And then his students, like even students right now, um, the ones teachers in the room, said, I, I really, you know, I, I didn't get what you were talking about. It's, it's much too much. So uh, 
he would then at night um, try to put the whole lecture into just a one, uh, maybe one or three or four stanzas, like a short poem. And then the students would memorize that poem or that, those, that paragraph, right? And so over time, these were collected and put together and uh, written down and came to be called uh, the Treasury of Higher Knowledge. But what you see on the screen here is, um, and then he did a commentary on his own work, which is a very uh, typical way to do things. So it'd be like you publish your book, those who have published, and then uh, you get ahead of the critics and you write your own commentary on it. <laughs> uh, and this ornament of Abhidharma is actually um, uh, one of the first commentaries written by a Tibetan. Uh, where, because uh, all the Indian works were seen as very high and almost don't comment on them. So uh, this, this Lama uh, wrote a commentary in Tibetan, which became very popular and was also um, much studied. So the whole uh, system lineage goes forth where people are commenting on original texts, so-called, and then they're commenting on the commentaries. So, uh, one of my friends calls Buddhism the longest running debate society. So, um, and, and there's, there's rarely complete absolute agreement, you know, in any of the, even within very tight Buddhist traditions, so everyone has a little different takes, so um, we call it a comment. Thank you, Elizabeth, for giving me a chance. Oh, <clears throat> well, you can address the next issue of Dukkha and Sukha. <laughs> <laughs> I like the tomatoes there. Are that from your garden? No, they're stock photos. <laughs> you wanted these for cultivation purposes. Oh, OK. Yeah. Got it. <laughs> so um, Dr. Goodman Stephen, who passed away, a few years ago, actually, um, was a scholar practitioner, and he uh, defined dukkha, um, which is as uh, tight space, too tight, feeling constricted, constricted space. Um, because ka in, uh, can mean like space, and do is uh, like dis, you know, from Greek, like dis ease, right? So it's a too tight space, where usually it's just translated as suffering. But um, much of uh, how he looks at the Abhidharma has to do with uh, the sense of space or lack of it. Yeah, okay, crowded space, thank you. This is a really good picture here. <laughs> I don't know, maybe they're enjoying themselves. So you uh, get that, that too crowded. Uh, and then it's a bit off balance also. It's an awful feeling being too crowded. Yeah, too crowded. So that's that's Dukkha. There's no space. There's no freedom. And uh, the opposite of Dukkha um, would be Sukha. I think we have a slide on that, don't we? No, no. Okay, so. Uh, I don't say it quite there yet, but sukha is um, uncrowded space, open space. I like sukha is related to sugar <laughs> or sweetness. So it's sweet, but you know, space is like somewhere in India, like if you can, you're not hitting anything, right? object you're gonna, you're gonna hit, it's painful. But um, when you don't, you don't hit anything, then you will feel free and at ease and has a sense of well-being or 
this. Not kidding anything. Do you want to say anything more about that, Zima? <clears throat> no, I don't. But I would like to welcome you to reality. <laughs> yeah, why don't you take this one? <laughs> well, this is this is a definition of abhi, which means making manifest, and dharma, which means making known or cognizing. This is an introduction of what there is. What is there? What is actually there? And the one thing we have to acknowledge right here is Vasubandhu was a Yogacharya. So that's the mind only school. It's not a Majamaika school or the middle way. This was based on what you could observe while you were practicing and what you could observe while you're practicing in a rather grand way is your mind. So what there is was really a key important part of their take on the Abhidharma. So what they were looking for was a direct perception of reality. In order to reach freedom, they needed to know what was going on in their mind in reaction to their world, because that was more important in terms of practice than um, uh, say the Majamaika uh, negation of reality. Um, Lama, Lama, so go ahead. You're, you're a little bit down on Madhyamaka. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not at, I'm not at all. I'm just trying to draw a contrast here. So you, you do a better job for me, please. Yeah, it's a, a different kind of broad school. So Yogacara means practitioners of yoga. So we're all Yogacharans, right? We want to be practitioners of yoga. Like that. So the question is, um, what's our actual experience uh, you know staying with our real lived experience so uh, we must have that um, and that's the whole point of that teaching is to you that's true for you it must be your lived experience uh, the Bandyamakans uh, were interested in of, of course that same too their yoga is too yoga means too but they're also interested in what, what must be our experience. So they're a little bit more interested in ontology. So um, I've had these discussions with people. So um, I say, what's your experience of the planet? And they go, it's flat. That's my experience, and it's true for me. Or um, the vaccine. Um, the plot of Bill Gates. That's my truth. That's my experience. So um, when you have that kind of dialogue with someone, um, then you know you have to say, "Well, um, I understand that's your belief, but uh, how could that be your actual experience? Because that entails a contradiction. Th there's a problem going on here that I need to bring your attention to." So that kind of Madhyamikan style is not to deny our actual experience, but to point out that um, uh, what we experience also um, is essential to our experience is our projections. And that what human beings do is uh, project certain uh, irrational things on our actual lived experience. So, uh, in our school, we, 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 we use both positions. We want, to, we want to hear about your actual experience. We want to hear if you think the world is flat, um, but we also want to have a dialogue. Like, how could that be so? So and the, the two actually go together.
I'm just a little test for uh, the audience. What is the popular Abhidharma term that's used today? Uh, it's just everywhere. Mindfulness, that's it. Mindfulness. So, well, we may not get to it today, but um, uh, Shmurti or uh, Trempa in Tibetan um, sometimes is um, um, translated as recollection or early memory. But in uh, the West, we're calling it mindfulness. It's like not forgetting what you're doing. That's human beings, we just forget what we're doing constantly. So, uh, one of the key factors that is enumerated in the Buddhist is you have to really get this. You, you, you really, you know, like we have, we have a whole bunch of nice rituals and meditations and community events and nice pictures and beautiful temples. But if you don't get mindfulness, I'm not getting it. You must get this. So the Abhidharma means things you really must get. We really want you to get this. You might not be very devotional. You might not go to a temple. You might not even do a lot of meditation. But you have to get more points. That's why it's higher. You can't. You must have it. If you're clueless, right? If you're mindless, right? It's dangerous, right? So. Therapy, when I help people get on disability, uh, one of the prime uh, factors of disability is people can't remember what they're doing. If you can't remember what you're doing, you're actually dangerous, right? <laughs> you don't have good judgment, you know. Um, if you can't concentrate, it's a problem, right? Yeah, then, then you need to take your hours up or whatever, but. <laughs> but really nothing makes up for mindfulness. That's one of the key, you know, Abhidharma would say that's we have to that. So it's a dharma because it actually it actually has some functionality and exists. Okay, so now what Seema, could you explain this one? Well we've already covered this. Yeah. You you described uh, how Vasubandhu uh, gave lectures and then he summarized them and then he uh, commented on them. So I'm going to move to the next slide. I like the photo. Uh, yeah. Oh, do you want to see that again? There you go. You I like, like that? I like yeah, that. So happy. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's Japanese. Uh, okay. Um. So. The two main texts were the Amidharma Kosha and the Abhidharma Samachaya, which is a little easier to read. This was written by uh, Vasubandhu's half brother, Asanga. They were both at Nalanda. Um, and in it, they began to pick apart the different aspects of consciousness. Uh, and they created what they called dharmas, or those aspects that you um, pay attention to. Vasubandhu had 75 dharmas, and the Sangha created or highlighted a hundred. And Lama wanted to point out here that no matter that there's a 25 consciousness item um, disparency that they are all the same. They are divided into conditioned and unconditioned dharmas. So there's no contradiction in the two lists of Abhidharma dharmas. <laughs> well, you want to fix that, Mama? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I just want to, uh, why, you know, you, people in the audience, like, why are we talking about these texts? 
I mean, it seems overly scholarly and erudite. Um, one reason is um, because they do contain a lot of wisdom, but um, when when Buddha Dharma went to Tibet uh, over several centuries, um, it was a little bit like what's happening in the West is everything shows up. And after a couple of hundred years, people uh, also started going, well, what's, what teachers are good and what teachers are crazy? And some of these stuff seems, you are calling it Buddhism, but you know, I don't know, and there seems so much contradiction. So uh, there arose movements within uh, the Tibetan tradition to uh, say, let's go back to the, some of the original texts because people, let's see what actually uh, the Indians were saying before they came to Tibet. And we messed with it a little bit, kind of like that. It's not quite the same as going back to the Bible, but it's a little bit similar in the sense that um, we, we don't want to just go on what people are saying currently. We recognize that there are others coming before us that um, have wise words to say. In contemporary Dharma talks, you, from Americans, you very rarely hear um, reference to textual things, right? Um, that's, that's cool, but also um, it makes it sound like that person is just kind of, it's just kind of coming out straight through their meditation practice. Whereas um, it's also coming from one teachers and from what you've read, right? So it's acknowledging sources for those people of written doctoral thesis out there. Like if you don't reference a source, it's not good, right? You don't want to make it up like your own. You don't want to do plagiarism, but you also want to recognize your source. So that's why we that's why we spend a little bit of time with like these people did this, and these are the commentaries. So we're not just making it up. What's left now? Oh, probably. oh, there's a there's a few things we got to go quickly through because I want to do an experiment uh -oh. that we did. That we didn't talk about. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Fair is fair. All right. <laughs> so okay. we want to talk about prajna. Okay. See and that's go. always uh, visualized in the Tibetan world as a woman. And we want to think about it in terms of view and practice. So in, in essence, cultivation also means prajna. So that is a level of contemplation. So here are the application of discerning factors, of course. So there's in terms, there's prajna in terms of how to listen. There's prajna in terms of how to reflect on what was heard. And there's prajna in terms of meditation how to go deeply with what one has reflected on. And this is a way to think about the Abhidharma. It's a slower process, but it's not an impossible process. And now we need to go to the deeper level. What actually is the Abhidharma? Well, let, let's, let's say a few things about Prajna first. Okay, all right. <laughs> that's a Sanskrit term that's usually translated as wisdom. Um, if we break it down uh, etymology, it means uh, the wisdom which has the ability to discriminate and know things. So it's able to say that's uh, to notice, to perceive, that's, that's black, that's blue, that's close, that's far. So uh, mindfulness is also a cognitive function uh, that Abhidharma is to me absolutely important. And then of course, Parjana, the uh, wisdom or the discernment 
um, is absolutely essential. So that's what would be called another truth or another actual experience that we need to cultivate. So we, we just earlier uh, did the Prajna Paramita to write the discourse on the wisdom that's gone beyond all dualism. And that's the wisdom we're after. We're after direct knowledge that at the same time is able to distinguish what's helpful and not helpful, what's true and what's false. Do we, do we need the wisdom? Yes. So without the wisdom, we really won't be able to achieve real peace. And I know many of us pray for peace. Now and uh, want to manifest it in our own lives, but don't always know how to get there. So uh, through wisdom, through mindfulness, then there's going to be real peace. Wouldn't that be great? Okay, please continue. Well, the big reveal then is what is Abhidharma? I mean, this is like the best part as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> it's, <laughs> It's a description of mind and body without a personal self. This is really fun. <laughs> oh, you got a typo there. I missed it. Where? Look at it. We'll oh. get it. Okay. Oh, all right. That's discriminated, you know, also. But without aggression, like, oh, just missing. <laughs> it also... I mean, uh, the next talk I'm working on is how to escape samsara through the Abhidharma. And so I'm so excited about this. So I'd like to say a little bit about mind and body without personal self. So um, this, I, this is my injection a little bit. Um, so the Buddha made a claim like I couldn't find an Atman. I could not find a solid soul or self existing apart from our experience, existing apart from our body or mind. I couldn't find something that exists permanently, owns itself, um, controls things, and has its own essence. I couldn't find that. I could just find this uh, changing, interpenetrating process, which uh, he described the five skandhas. So just a heap of experiences, basically. So you have that realization, or you, that's the truth for you, or for him, or for her, or anybody. But how do you express that then? How do you do language, and how do you talk about things without using personal self? You ever tried it? It's very difficult. You know, so, you know, all the time people go, yeah, I just realized I have no, no soul or self. Well, who's saying that, right? You know, how do you, how do we use language and how would we describe reality and inner reality too, not just scientific reality, if, if we didn't include like uh, some belief in some internal organizing force, right? How do we do it? So the Abhidharma as a description of what reality would be like if you didn't put the self at a center organizing it, something like that. It's difficult. What do you think? There, okay, thank you, perfect. Go ahead, Lama. This okay. one you better do. <laughs> yeah, usually this one is ha like, has an H in it. But, so, uh, Skandhism, to me, like just a, uh, literally uh, a heap or a collection. And so I like, I like the statue there, like that. So the Buddha said, I, I didn't find an Atman at the core, this is all I found. I found this form, this body and these objects. I found sensations that are pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. I found perceptions that I could notice, like that's a table, that's a chair, 
that's thinking. Uh, Stephen Goodman says mental acuity, that's generally all the emotional and, uh, and thought processes that all of us keep together. And then finally, I found consciousness. In other words, I can be aware that I'm aware. But I didn't find any organizing, centralizing self whatsoever. There's nothing behind those. There's no organizing self you know, behind those or above those or in them. Organize, the, the skandhas themselves don't constitute a self in the sense of an Atman as a permanently uh, permanent being that owns its own consciousness, didn't find any of that. They're all changeable. They're all impermanent. Even consciousness. Usually when we say that, people don't immediately feel free. But... <laughs> <laughs> but the outcome, we investigate it free, deeply, 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 then uh, uh, many, um, many of our problems with self and others uh, seem to transform. You want to say something, Elizabeth? We only have a few minutes. Oh, no, I'm just, um, I'm just thinking about that. Okay, I, good. I, I like this. It just takes some thinking, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it does. Well, you don't have to believe it. See, so so much of the meditations that we do um, are, of course, in America, mindfulness-based meditations that are just based on calming down, and relieving our anxiety, getting more stable, emotional <laughs> regulation, those things that are great. We like those. But when we start looking like who's doing all this and what's actually going on, and we have to look deeply, and that does take time. We may, we may find something out, so I'm always interested, like, don't just say, oh, I, I found out, well, I found out there's no self, I found emptiness, and I go, well, how, how'd you do it? It won't be acceptable, I'll just say, well, I read in the book, and yeah, I was at the talk. <laughs> See, it must be personal experience, that you use other people's experience to um, bounce off of, right? But how did you get there? You know, I'm, not, I'm not sitting under the Bodhi tree, and you get this in India. How did you get there? What's this? This is a elucidation of the previous slide. Um, kind of. These these are also considered um, dharmas in the sense is something we can actually experience and is real and we need. So we need intention. We need effort. We need to be conscious of what we're doing, and we definitely need investigation. So these are activities uh, that are. Are necessary and real. So if you want, you know, so they're not directly related to the skandhas, except these would come under, you know, consciousness, come out under mental acuity and so forth. But the reason these are included because um, in order to realize who we are, we do need intention, we need effort, we need to know what we're doing, we need to be investigators like that. Okay, so the next one is my experiment. Okay. Um, these are the Dachus. These are part of the um, of the Abhidharma, part of the 175 different aspects. These are really easy because we see them or hear them or taste them or experience them in our body or we create them in our minds. And you want to talk about what's going on with the Datus here, Lama, with the field and object and integrational function? So this a schema that's an Abhidharma schema um, that the Buddha pointed out again, like what's actually happening. So instead of saying, uh, 
just naive reality. I'm I'm seeing you. I'm seeing the chair. We're actually going. I sees a form through visual perception. So for an experience to occur, we need these three things. We need the ear. Uh, we need sound, and we need uh, the ear brain function to work. So usually when people are talking about how do you know something or who are you, we're just going, I, I know it. <laughs> no. So it's just a claim, right? I know it. I know the earth is flat. How do you know the earth is flat? Because I know it. It's kind of circular, right? I know what I know because I know. It's Popeye. I am who I am. Okay. So we don't accept that. We, we'd say, no, there's, there's a process going on. And we figured out how the processes work, and the process can work without a centralizing function. Maybe there's some neurological people in here. No? Uh, I think that's a Stephen Goodman. I don't know. <laughs> that's like. My physics teacher used to say, there's just stuff, you know, so um, I, I think that's like all the emotions, it's all the emotions and uh, ideas we have. Yeah. We're paying attention to stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> They're having a little individual debate here. That's yes. probably it's not. Vocabulary. Okay. <laughs> this, is, this is what they do. <laughs> so, um, I really appreciate people's patience because in a way this is very dry, um, but uh, sometimes maps are interesting too. So when I, I'm very enthusiastic when I take a trip, but um, I always think, oh, it's great and fun. Um, it's not much fun when we get lost and the maps can be fairly dry. And there's always a little bit difference in the maps too. There's maps and then there's Google Maps, right? <laughs> Which one's better? <laughs> so um, these are maps to say how we get to peace. And uh, if there's no one in here to fight with, maybe there might be not a fight, right? Are you going to fight with the nose? I'm going to fight with the smell. I'm going to fight with the olfactory sense of the brain. Right? Who are you fighting with? So usually people say, I'm fighting with Putin. I'm fighting with Bush. Or I'm fighting with Biden. You know, fighting. But, so who are, you, who are you fighting with? Can you fight with the mind? Can you find fight with emotions? Who are you fighting with? So there's no sense of the usual person in this, is there? Yes. We have, yeah, so we're almost done here, so I'm glad you have a question. So my question is regarding the dodges. Are there more? Because from what I understand, those are all just physical body and not really representation of all the other bodies that we can hold. If that makes sense, you know, like our auras and all that kind of stuff. Um, like this eye, and then this eye consciousness, and then this eye, you know, that's what the brain does. So, um, uh, even if you say there are other universes, you're going to say, I know there are other universes because I'm thinking about them sense them so it would come back to this right you have to use i mean this is it you like if someone has an experience the earth is flat you say, okay like which one did you use your eye your ear your nose your tongue your body your mind but how did you know how did you come up with that well okay i used my eye because i'm looking over mckinley park and it's absolutely flat and then, then, whoops, then you pick up Here's a picture of you know, Earth from the moon. This is the eye, like. Right? So are you saying you're going to deny your eye? This is, this is eye. 
And they say, no, that's not real. <laughs> so then, you know, so uh, then you have to work from another thing. But the Buddha is saying, I don't care whether you're talking about psychic experiences or other worlds or anything, it's going to come down to basically these six, you know, uh, six senses, right? If you use any language or you think you know anything, uh, it's going to come down. You know, saying mind that knows is sensing, you know, has consciousness, allows it to know, and it's going to be conscious and stuff. So we're very, uh, this is a very technical talk, so it is not, I mean, you know, we should follow up with a Pema Chodron talk or something. <laughs> just soften and be compassionate. But um, when we're dealing with society and we're dealing with ourselves, we have a right and we need to know ourselves. How do we know that? You know, you know, so it's just cause and effect, right? So it says, okay, well, it's good tough with Russia. Okay, how do you want to do that? Yeah, so then, yeah, I actually talked to somebody that said, you know, bomb them. Okay, and you see, we get to ask, well, what do you think the consequence? And, you know, with what reasoning, with what sense basis, what, what do you think is going to happen, right? So the Abhidharma is about what, what functions of the senses are really true and how do they actually work so that we can actually know who we are and how things work. Otherwise, we're just saying, my opinion is we should do nothing. My opinion is we should make Moscow. My opinion is we're this flat. My opinion is, you know, we can fly. So we're not interested in opinion. We want to get to knowledge, right? That's a question. We want to know that love and peace works. We want to know how to achieve love and wisdom and peace. We want our kids to grow up and have a world that isn't, you know, burning up, right? So how do we do that through cause and effect? And all we have is the six senses. That's it. Now, so we don't have some absolute self that knows exactly what's going to do, and there's not there's not an outside deity that's going to tell us what to do. Just this. Can you get by with just this? How about it? Just, can we just get by on our six senses? Raise your hand. Yeah, 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 maybe we could. That's it. We just have our senses, and if they're operating properly, we don't make a mess of things, and we have fun, and we have good food, and pleasant company, and beauty, and we have poetry. <clears throat> so I'll just I'll give a little pitch like love and uh, Friday night um, we had some nice poetry and music um, I actually bought my first poetry book in years and I can't remember Veronica it's really nice just short poetry who, who likes poetry in the here who believes that actually poets can help save the world yeah yes Correct answer. <laughs> so one of the final ways that uh, uh, teachers, both in the Vajrayana tantric tradition and the Zen tradition, um, uh, you know, test your um, compassion and your knowledge is: can you put it into poetry? Interesting, right? You know, instead of going, you know, when it's, I mean, everyone can go. You know, everything is interdependent and you're a good person. I mean, actually, that takes a lot. But can you, can you express your realization poetically? And then could you even sing it? I haven't made anybody do that in a long time. But uh, in real, on the chakras, tantra peace, you can just call on somebody and say, could you, could you sing? Sing who you are. Right? It's really great. It's on the spot. It's immediate. 
complete, immediate, unmediated experience. So uh, I, I really don't know what good poetry and bad poetry is. I hope to, to learn from poets here in Sacramento. Um, you know, I, I don't know how to make those distinctions, but um, I'm, I'm still a student, so I want to um, find out. You know, one time I'll just tell a story and that like, I was really brave when I was practicing Zen at Ring of Zendo with Gary Snyder. So, like, I think I was drinking back then, but so I gave him a poem to look at. And that was the end of my poetry career. Uh, <laughs> Did you like my poetry? Was like, <laughs> no, he actually said um, it was very nice. Yeah, you know, I don't know what that means. But <laughs> yeah, like that. So. <clears throat> okay, so uh, maybe we can uh, bring back Elizabeth Zima in person, okay? Next time, Elizabeth? Yes. We need more of this, don't you think? Well, I don't know if it was too boring. No, it's not boring. No, it's not boring. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's great. Okay, we have to do a dedication. Okay, so. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain a state of Guru Buddha and lead all living beings, without exception, into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen rise and grow. May that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, through the source of all happiness and good, all powerful, generous, and gods of the remain in the land. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Low song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones. Merciful giver, a stream of profound and vast instruction to the fortunate migrators. Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, Avadokiteshvara, great treasure of happiness and happiness. Nandri Shri, Master of Flawless Wisdom, Vajrapani, Sunkhapa, Brown Jewel of the Snowy Land Sages, Bosandrapa, I'm going to hang out, of course. We have some, I think we have some food. We should always have some food, right? Yeah. But, uh, we're not as big as the Sikh temple. Anybody been to one of the Sikh temples in West Sac? That's incredible, you know, so no one goes hungry, you know, it's nice. And uh, I, don't, I don't know if Colleen can hang out. Yeah, uh, but you can say hi for a second. So uh, it, it's absolutely essential that we have scientific, psychological of the times, Dharma, um, where you don't have to even say I'm Buddhist. Dharma just means the truth. So like that, and that's really the foundation here, right? There's only very few people that want to do all the, you know, strange retreats and all these <laughs> complicated things that uh, have evolved. Um, so it is possible to um, do it uh, completely in a secular fashion, right? I just happen to be, have had the karma to be attracted to these incredible teachers who talked me into doing many meditation retreats and <laughs> reading all these books and, and they're relaxing, so I read them. Okay, thank you. Ciao. <laughs>